Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Create, Connect, Communicate, the EMG podcast. My name is Michelle Ponto, and I'm the Director of Content Strategy here at EMG. Today on my podcast, I'm talking with Judith Van Vliet from the Color Authority. As a color expert, Judith helps people to unleash color in their lives and businesses. Since 2007, she has been an active member of the Color Marketing Group, which is a nonprofit organization. Plus, she has worked as a senior color designer at Avian Color Works and as the creative director of Color Forward, which is a global color forecasting guide. Welcome to our podcast, Judith. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you for inviting me. That's my pleasure. I learned so, a little bit about your company just through LinkedIn and after visiting your website and researching some of your history. And I must admit, I'm intrigued about what you're doing. So tell me a little bit about the Color Authority. What do you do and how do you work with your clients? So indeed, just like you said, the Color Authority is there to indeed help people to unleash color in their lives and in their businesses. So I started out May 1st. So I actually just started out my own company, which indeed is the Color Authority. And it helped develop color trends for any type of market, for any type of industry through storytelling. Because through storytelling for me is is key. Then I help these companies, my clients with palette development as well. That's just one service that I'm doing as a color catalyst or the color consultant. I also do color consultancy. I moderate trends and color workshops as well. And I still do public speaking, which I enjoy very much because I think we need to spread more the word on color and its importance. Yeah. I work with an international network. So I think that's a little bit what's, what got me in this, in this company and why I chose to, to, to freelance indeed is because I work with a lot of people who are color minded, who have color as one of the first thoughts when they design. So I think it's interesting to work with many different clients worldwide, but also different industries. So that's, that's how I, I started a little bit. I started actually off with a, a not-for-profit organization that is purpose-driven, which is something that I enjoy a lot. The purpose-driven brands that actually want to use color to create awareness about social and environmental issues and how color you know, can enact change and also influence communities. So yeah, that's, that's a little bit what, what I'm currently doing for the Color Authority. Very interesting and very diverse. And usually when people think about color, they think fashion, cosmetics, interior design, but you work with all different types of companies, as you mentioned. A lot of our clients that we work with are in the B2B industrial space. So how important is color when it comes to these kind of industries, the plastics industries, industrial sectors? Is color still as important for them? Oh, definitely. Because I think regardless of your industry or material that you're working with, Color is key as it is one of the first informations that arrives to our human brain. So the first one is smell. Obviously online, you don't often have smell and also we don't all work like, for example, in the bakery. And so the second then would be shape and shape comes directly with color. Why? That's because the wrong color on a given shape or product has a huge impact on its success. What I've also read in multiple resources and what I found, obviously, in all my years of experiences is that up to 85% of the products that we buy, we are influenced by the color of that product. So, yes, I'd say that color is very important in any products. And when it comes to color trends, are there trends within these industrial areas the same as there are trends that are happening in fashion? And are the trends similar or completely different? There's a cross segmentation. So obviously, depending what your brand is, and obviously who are your main clients, depends on who you're going to be looking at for inspiration. Fashion is still highly inspirational and many aspire, especially the colors that pop up on on the catwalks. Then again, fashion is fast moving. It is indeed most of the time top end. So what you see is that a lot of industrial brands and companies in the B2B are also looking a little bit broader. And what you see is interesting that something that normally comes forward as in the color of trend in fashion is sometimes also shifting then to different industries and markets, maybe in a different timeline. So maybe a couple of months later, a couple of um, years later, but it's interesting to track when certain colors indeed arrive to maybe what is your market. And I think that's one of the key things that people that work in color, they have to understand. Generally, what I see as a trend 
not sure if we can still call this a trend because we have been obviously, you know, locked out of, of everything, everything that we, we, we enjoy. Many of us, especially so I'm podcasting and working out of Milan, Italy. You probably all know we were really stuck in our homes, especially during the first lockdown. So you, you couldn't even go into nature. So now that we see is that is a very important trend. So the naturalness, bringing nature into our homes, and then automatically with that comes more natural colors. How do you find the trends? Like you mentioned a little bit, you could see that, that nature is coming back into uh, is, is something that's popular this year because of the COVID thing and people are looking for ways mm-hmm. to bring the outside inside. How would you work with a company that is trying to figure out what their trend should be? If they should be following what's happening in fashion right now, if they should be following what's happening in, I don't know, because sometimes car trends or colors are a little bit different from yeah. things that are happening in home. Is some of these trends sometimes feared by sentiments within the industry? For example, in plastic, sustainability is in green and climate is kind of something that is popular right now so people are looking for more of those naturey kind of tones or does that kind of play a role it does play a very important role so just what you mentioned the whole sustainability in in my opinion that's not a trend anymore that's just how we need to live period and that's also what young generations are demanding they do not enjoy buying from brands or or buying products that are purely market driven. And I think that's a little bit how our past, we've all been doing this, selling more and more and more, right? Like the more we can sell, the happier we are, stakeholders get happy, you know, the, the value of companies rise, but that's not really where I believe things, things are going when we talk about environmental issues, sustainability, and the, the natural feeling and the trends that I hear from this topic. So when I work with a client, the first thing is I, what I need to understand is who is their target? Who is their consumer? Who's, who are they speaking to? Where do they live? What region in the world? Where do they sell their products? For example, how do they interact also through digital resources with their clients? Then you go and look at the broader picture. So once you know who they are, you're going to look first outwards. So you're going to look to external factors, external factors that influence us on the conscious or unconscious level. I think most of the time this is unconscious, but this can be political systems, obviously economical factors, social factors, and indeed things as climate change, they do influence how we feel, how we behave. And then obviously to what colors we're going to be more sensitive in the near future. So it's important to understand multiple aspects. First, who you're selling to, where's your main client, who's your target group, and how are they feeling? How are they behaving because of their direct surroundings? And how do they change their needs? Needs, you know, we're human beings. Changes Mm -hmm. are only constant. I think that's something that was very clear from this past crisis. But we have continuously new behaviors and new needs. And once you understand what that current need is of your clients, that's gold. Because then you can tap into what they need and what you have to bring to them. So that's a little bit, I mean, obviously, there's a lot more that goes into trend research and working with clients. But that's key. Mm -hmm. Color is also an emotional translation always. So you have to understand the psyche of your consumer like how are they feeling how they're behaving what are their needs and how do I tap into that and is that part of the storytelling that you mentioned at the beginning yeah but it's not just these are the trends these are the colors you should use there's there's a story behind or there's a reason yeah I it's it's hard you know maybe with people that at a certain point you work with a lot and they know you and they know that you are somebody that they can trust and I'll tell them this is the yellow, that's going to work. Just take it, you know, and and work with it. That hardly ever happens. People need to know why you pick that color. What is the story behind? What is the main driver? What influenced you or your brand or your product to pick that color? And then obviously, how is it applied? Because it's never just color or developing colors, how you apply it on different materials, different finishes and different textures. So yes, looking into those external factors, looking into influencers, what is happening in your particular industry, 
industries that are, let's say, linked to your, your direct market, because that widens a little bit the scope. And because I said, there's a lot of influences coming from different industries to your industry. So as, as soon as you start researching that, you understand who is your client, then you do the storytelling. One thing with storytelling, though, which not a lot of people are aware of, because color is emotional, it's not objective because it's personal for you and it's personal for me, you have to tap into emotions and feelings within the storytelling because that's how people can relate. They need to relate to your story, to their direct need or indirect need, and then understand why you pick that color. There's a lot that goes into, uh, yeah, it's not most psychological, the why you pick the colors and how they're going to work. I was reading on your website that color is an influencer. You say you connect with influencers, but color is also an influencer and that you like to work with purposeful brands and help them use it to influence their environment and enable change. How does this work or how, how have you done this in the past? So what we, I think by now it's clear that everybody reacts to color and that color has a very high impact on well-being, whether indeed consciously or unconsciously, we still are trying to find out why people behave within certain spaces that are colored in a certain way. That also because it's personal. Like if I maybe was sick as a child eating a yellow curry, which actually was true, I could not stand that color for a very long time. So this is obviously that's color psychology, but also color inherited values that you have. But when we look at just generally, we are influenced by our direct surroundings and psychologically, our environment affects how we react and how we feel. So living in a beautiful surrounding makes people feel good, makes them perhaps even happy, but certainly it will make them feel proud. And certain colors, for example, create more energy. They can create more optimism, but it can also create calmness, for example. Being part of a beautiful place, a city or an office or a home has shown to have a positive impact on people living in these places. And if people feel well, they act in more positive ways than when feeling, for example, frustrated or angry or even, you know, lately depression is, is, is a true important topic. So, yes, I do think that color can do a lot to the human psyche and thus enact change. I can't really talk about the project I'm working on right now, but it is an awareness project where color, because color is so visible, when you use that in a campaign, for example, an awareness campaign for indeed a social project, so either whether you're talking about the environment or you're talking about communities, it attracts the eye Mm -hmm. and it can create a lot of visibility for your cause. So it is in attraction to the eye. So I do think that color can be used in similar ways. So either when you work and want to create awareness, but also how it directly makes people feel when they're in a space. When you do this, though, you have to be very careful because too little color or too much color can be exhaustive. And then, of course, when you're, for example, in a red room for a lot of time, you lose track of time. You, you don't know what time it is. You don't know how much time you've been in there. It depends on what you want your, your community or people to feel like. But so there are certain rules. There's no universal quote. Like there's, it's not like you pick this blue and everybody's going to be good and happy about that. So it's not just about picking the right color. It's also about the right nuance and how you want people to feel but also for how much time they're going to be in that space. And so if you want people to get creative or motivated, you use one certain color family. If you want them to calm down, you use probably the more the green family, but just not just a green, like a lime green won't do it. Probably <laughs> more a natural green. So it's, it's important to understand that part of color psychology. But yes, it, it, it has, I have been using it to enact change. And you see it when people are sitting in certain spaces, you can see that it does something to their their vibration, to their energy. Can color also cause a disconnect? So for example, say you have a brand and you have their message behind it. So when people hear the brand, they're already imagining something in their mind. But then if they picked a color that doesn't match that brand, somehow can cause a disconnect where people are like, why did they use the brown? I don't know why when I was expecting it to be green. Again, that could be completely personal, but generally that could be because the storytelling or maybe the, the selection of the color that this brand has, has chosen 
is not completely understandable throughout the work that they do or the services that they do. Just generally, when we imagine things, there's one part that obviously is, is, is I'm not a neuroscientist, but I obviously I've enjoyed listening to Bo Lotto, for example, who is a neuroscientist. So we know Coca-Cola is a red brand. We know that Nivea from Bayersdorf is, is blue. Like this is because our brain tracks this information. And at that moment, we connect it. When they then, for example, will change color, it could be that consumers could get a little bit confused if not explained well or indeed not taking the consumer by the hand within the, the storytelling of that particular choice. Mm -hmm. With some of our clients, well, with a lot of our clients, there's, there's a big show that's going to be coming up next year. It's the K2022 show. It's the biggest plastics and rubber show. It's only every three years. So they've already been anticipating it because things are getting back to, to normal. And the theme of the show this year is going to be on digitalization, circular economy, and um, climate production. So, of course, everybody is wanting to convey their messages in this area, probably using color because they're going to have big booths, video, and emotional stuff. How can they create stories that are unique to them? You don't want everybody to just use green or wood or try to look natural. And as, as you all already mentioned, yeah. people already have heard sustainability for the last five years, 10 years. and that's been done. What tips would you get them to help them to stand out from the crowd? And how should they be looking at their storytelling when we know everyone's going to be thinking about the same theme? Yeah, well, color attracts the eye. So yes, of course, it, careful not to be overwhelming from what I just said to your audience either. If you want them to spend time in your booth, then again, certain colors, they won't help. Too little color in data, as I said, can be not good either or exhaustive. Now, gray is one of the safest colors to pick, hence why it's so often picked within architectural buildings, because it enhances more like, let's say, neutral feelings. It's one of the only universal codes that, that tends to exist. I would not use gray for that very reason when I create a booth. The key, I think, is, is to show that you're bold, you're not afraid to use color. There's still a lot out there that are afraid to use color. Then again, within the storytelling for the color that you're going to be picking, and it, indeed, it doesn't have to be the natural greens because that is an important trend. Sustainability is not just about greens anymore. It's, it's, it's a way wider area of color families that is being used within sustainability. But the important is that people will indeed understand why you pick that color and how that relates. Branding is key. So if you're going to do a particular branding for a fair, it either should be in line with your company's brand, which I know most are still using that as well. So either you use the branding of your company, which makes things easier, but not necessarily that doesn't make it sexy or definitely not. It doesn't tap into the theme that you just explained for the K2022. I think that you can use color as a vehicle to talk to your audience. And that is key to show that you're not afraid of it. The message that you want is it needs to translate through the color that you pick. And the topics that you just mentioned, digitalization of color, huge. We've seen that right now. We work from home. We will continue to do so for, I think, an extended time. We we'll probably have a mix of work and, and indeed working in the office and at home. But still talking color through a screen is hard. Yet, I think that if you're going to do indeed a certain color for your stand, for your installation, it needs to be communicated correctly through a screen. So the digital part needs to be done well. And I think there's not many that get it right. I think the first one that can get color authenticity digitally done well is a true wither. So that's for the, the tech companies out there. As for the climate change protection and the circular economy, yes, given facts, just like sustainability. But as I said, that doesn't mean you need to go green as, as a color green within, within your stands. There's a lot of colors that, that can be used. Green is a very simple choice. Then again, when we talk about the greens, I don't know how many they are, but there's over hundreds, probably a thousand. So it's about picking that right nuance that will explain your story. I'd be very careful when you want to go green and show that you're very sustainable because it's, I think it's a tricky area and younger generations are starting to understand who is truthfully 
taking action and who's pushing sustainability marketing wise. And I think we've all seen that happening. So climate change, circular economy, there are no trends. And I definitely make your audience understand that you understand these issues and you are truthfully taking action. Now, when you think about action, colors normally are in the red color family. Mm -hmm. So that's very different from when you think about sustainability and, and climate protection. One of the things I think the issue of the, the plastics in the oceans or whatever material that's in the ocean, whether it sinks or not, that's the issue with, with plastic. It doesn't sink. It's not about using, however, recycled materials. Using recycled materials, in my opinion, is already a given. It's not innovative and it's not enough. So depending on what you're going to showcase on your stand, it needs to go well beyond that because social projects that maybe help clean up the mess that we all made together, because it's not one person's fault or one country's fault, just indeed, not as a marketing case, but responsibility and stop shifting that responsibility to others, you know, walk, walk the talk, you know, mm -hmm. that's, that's what Americans say, just walk the talk because young generations that are going to enter the workforce right now or are entering the workforce and going to be buying your products, yes or not, they demand action. So I don't have a magic solution to, to what color you could pick as that still is depending on what's your brand, what's your inherent culture from, from your, your company culture, and also what is your, the materials, the product that you're selling. But yeah, I do think generally no magic solution here. But due to the current lack of resources and raw materials, I mean, I think we've seen that all in pricing as well. I think it's time to research also new manufacturing processes, natural dyeing and coloring for materials. And coming back to the naturalness, even letting these materials be what they are without adding that all that extra coloring and textures and, and, and other type of, of stuff that you add to a product, which later is going to make recyclability a lot more complicated. Yeah, that's true. And I like your idea that it doesn't have to be about green. It could be about what the company represents in these areas. I like the, the thought of thinking about color as action. Mm -hmm. Maybe color is something positive rather than just thinking green is the color. <laughs> so even if the K has a certain, you know, probably, they, you know, they have, they have this theme, I would suggest companies to, to have a sub theme and concentrate on that. And then for that, indeed, choose a, a strategy and a color strategy that explains what you're going to be showcasing. Very, very good advice. I have another question for you. So just as a general thing, what tips would you give marketers who have to create a story around color? And sometimes they don't have the choice. They're not part of that team that gets to pick the color. Mm -hmm. They're the team that has to market the color that their other people have, have picked out. What kind of tips would you give them? You don't want to have them always say, oh, here we're Coke. We picked red because of this. But somehow that message has to be connected without having to say it all the time. Yep. Well, if you work in marketing, there is one thing that maybe you do uh, tap into, which is your consumer, where designers, not always, you know, they, they are waiting for that. Info. So the people that normally pick the colors in a company, sometimes depending on the company, it is marketeers, but very often it is designers. And in some cases it's even R&D. But in case you are a marketeer and you're not directly picking a color, yes, of course, communicate with those who have, but you have an opportunity, and that is to, to talk to your consumer and to try to understand, indeed, again, what I said earlier, connected to the human psychology. So when you pick a color or develop a color or you're given a color, try to understand who you're going to be speaking to. Where do they live in this world? Who are they? How old are they? What generations are they? How do they live? How do they eat? You know, there's a lot that goes into that, but also the cultural background, because you still have certain colors that just are better to avoid in certain cultures. You need to understand their surroundings as well. So this is, that's actually a big pro when you work in marketing because you have access to that information where maybe the person who picked that color does not have access. So again, tapping into the emotions and feelings of your direct end consumer and translate indeed what you're seeing generally, how you observe your market, but also beyond that market. So those external factors, 
how people are feeling within political systems, the economy that obviously is, is not doing too well in most of the countries. So how does that translate in, in the emotional translation of that color again? So what is that message that you can easily relate? And very often, it's just about going back to yourself. How are you feeling within certain informations and, and, and the informations that are receiving to you? How are you feeling in a situation um, such as, as COVID or whatever? It can be any type of situation. Talk to friends and family. There is everybody has a network. Everybody has a network that sees things differently. So it's always about communicating with those around you, sharing information and getting that information. And that's, that's how I do a lot of storytelling, talking to other people about what's happening in the world. Just, you know, tap into your network, not necessarily are there designers or marketeers. They can be, they can be doctors. They can be lawyers. They're all in the end consumers. So it's, that's how I would, would, advise people to truly see their customer and understand what their needs are. And then you can relate that. When you understand that part, you can rather easily connect that color, whether you've chosen it or not. Understanding needs, it's like almost an automatic translation into whatever product, which can be color or or anything really. Do you find, and I'm I'm assuming you have found because you just started this company in, in May, that there is a more demand for the storytelling around color and for people who have your expertise? And and why is this demand growing? I think that people have understood more and more, maybe because being locked out from from the rest of the world for an extended time, is that digital presence is important. And digital presence still is largely, obviously, visual. So that means color can really attract the eye. The the part of storytelling is because I do believe that a lot of people have been starting to tell their story. I think that's something that you've, you've seen a lot during this period of time. People need to be understood. They need to be to be seen. And I think that that is a very good explanation for why people are more into color and storytelling. But an older trend is behind all of this, which is like an enormous layer, which is information and truthful information. People are looking into the why. I'm not sure if you've seen that research where last year when when COVID had just started, the most asked question in Google was why? Why is the earth this in this color? Why is COVID here? Why am I feeling like that? Why? So why? always has been important but I think now it has come to the surface so why Judith have you picked this red for my company and if I can't tell them why they're just going to be like okay whatever next that makes sense yeah I think people are also getting a little bit smarter you're right people want to know they don't take things for granted anymore and I think even the as a marketer or, or the people within the companies, they are taking color more seriously as well too, because they are also understanding the effects of, yeah. of how it can help them with conveying that message of what the, the product does or, or what their company does or the environment that they want to create. Careful though, uh, with the online pitfalls, there's a lot of information available online. There's a lot of copy pasting of, of information and there's a lot of color misperceptions going on. That's tricky. So, Because if you're going to believe whatever is written online on certain colors, and trust me, there's some information that I'm like, how on earth did they get to this conclusion? Check your resources. And if there's multiple resources that are saying the same thing about this part, especially with color psychology, make sure that you do your research well, because nobody wants to look like a fool by picking a certain color because of something that they read online. Make sure that you, you fact track a lot, but also go back to universities, libraries, you know, older researchers, and that's just the latest news stories that you find in, in your search engine. Yes, there's fake news everywhere, even in color. <laughs> yeah, trust me. <laughs> yeah. We're almost out of time, but I do have one last question for you. I know that in addition to consulting on color, you have a podcast called The Color Authority, the same name as your company. What is this podcast about and where can our listeners find it? 
So in my podcast, I have what I definitely would say fascinating conversation with some of the most inspiring people in the world of color. That was mainly how I worked in season one. So now I'm actually preparing for season two, where I'm going to amplify my audience. I'm going to be talking to creatives that are not necessarily designers, but that do work with color on a daily basis and also to get their perspective on color. So the main goal of my podcast is to spread knowledge and expertise with regards to color and indeed throughout indeed interviewing people from different backgrounds all around the world and different industries. And yes, I got this idea during the lockdown, suffering from Zoom fatigue myself and all the visual input that I received constantly through the screen on a daily basis. And I just wanted people to be able to to learn about color and design while walking their dog or driving somewhere. So yeah, and the podcast is actually available on my website, which is thecolorauthority.com, but also on major podcast directories like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Google Music, Deezer, I'm everywhere. So you just need to Google it and it's, it will come up. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you for joining us today. It has been very enlightening, very colorful conversation that we had. <laughs> And for those of you listening, don't forget to tune in again next time for another exciting episode of Create, Connect, and Communicate. Until then, thank you, Judith, and everyone else. Have a great day. Thank you so much.